Today we're in chapter 20, verses 33 through 49, though. We're going to continue our study, so let me begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 20 at verse 33, and I'll read verses 33 through 36, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 20, beginning at verse 33, reading to verse 36. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will plead my case with you face to face, just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt, so I will plead my case with you, says the Lord God. Now, as we've been going through chapter 20 here in the book of Ezekiel, remember with me what has taken place. There were certain elders who had come to speak to him, to speak to Ezekiel, and, and what they did is they came to him seeking a word from the Lord. So they came to Ezekiel and sat before him in order that they might inquire of God. It may be that they wanted news of Israel. It may be that they wanted some insight into how long they were to remain in Babylon. It also may be that they, they were wondering why, why would uh, God not speak to them as, as he had spoken to the fathers in the past. And, and they want to hear news. They want to hear God speak to them. And they knew in their past history that God was very open to communicating with them. The psalmist in Psalm 44, verse 1, for example, says, We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in the days of old. And so our fathers have told us the things that you have done. They've communicated to us the things that you've done, the way that you moved and how you saved and how you delivered and the works that you did. Our, our fathers communicated that to us. And by the way, by way of application, that is something that we who are fathers, we who are parents... That's what we're supposed to be doing also, isn't it? We're supposed to be communicating to our kids, those of us who have our children and all. We're supposed to be communicating to our kids and even into our, our grandchildren the wondrous works of God, what God has done in the past, how God can move in their life now. That is something that we ought to be making an effort to do, to communicate to them the things of God. And, and, and God did so, and they're speaking about that. They're wondering perhaps, uh, is God going to reveal a word to us? God has done it in the past. And so they, they are seated there before Ezekiel, and, and they're expecting to receive some information from him. That's what we're seeing here in, in chapter 20. Now, as they're, they're seated before Ezekiel, God is outraged. He's outraged that they actually came to him seeking a message from them. So he asks them, have you come to inquire of me? And then goes on to say, I will not be inquired of you. God is outraged that these people would actually come seeking direction from him. Why? Well, he goes through chapter 20 and he marks out his case before them. And it's very simply put, in chapter 20 we see that God very clearly says your entire history from the time you were in Egypt has been one of rebellion and idolatry from the very beginning. When you were there in Egypt and I delivered you and then took you into the wilderness and even in the wilderness you continued in idolatry, even into the entering of the promised land to the point of uh, where you were just recently in, 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 in this, this nation. You have given yourselves over, God says through these verses, to idolatry. You, your, your entire history is earmarked by rebellion. So why do you want me to speak to you now? Have you guys ever had somebody that you've spoken to, poured your heart out to, shared with? And then they just turn around and walk away and do exactly the opposite of what you encourage them to do. Have you ever had that happen? I'm sure you have. You know, you give them advice. They come to you and they say, well, can you give me direction? And, and you look at them, are, are you willing to? Do you desire to hear? Are you, oh, yes, I need some direction. Will you help me? And, and so you spend an hour, two hours, sometimes three hours. Maybe you meet with them more than once, you know, to try and help them. And then they go out and do the exact opposite of everything you were encouraging them to. And then they come back later on, and they say, can you help me? And you say, yeah, I'll help you out the door. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, I, I spent all that time with you. I, I gave up a lot of time to share with you, and you did exactly the opposite of all that I communicated with you. I remember when our fellowship was very young, less than a year, a year old, a young lady called my wife Marie and would keep her on the phone for an hour 
or more every time she called, and she called quite often. And as she would call, I, I would come walking in from the office, and my wife would be there talking to this, this young lady, and, and it happened quite often. I'd come home quite often over a period of several weeks. This young lady was saying, I want to do something, and Marie was saying, this is really not a wise thing for you to do. To make a long story short, after all those weeks, the girl calls up and says, well, you remember what we've been talking about all this time? Well, I went, and I finally did it. So all those hours, all that prayerful counsel went for nothing, went for nothing. The girl was not willing to hear what was being said. She wanted to hear somebody say, go ahead and do it, experiment, and find out whether it's good for you, and, and that's what she did. I've had that happen. You've had that happen. God has had that happen. His people come and sit before him. They inquire of him, and God says, shall I be inquired of by you? I will not be inquired of by you. Why? Well, let me plead my case before you, God would say, because when you were in Egypt, you gave yourself over to idolatry and rebellion. When you left Egypt and were in the wilderness for all those years, you were still filled with rebellion and idolatry. When you finally entered into the land of promise, you continued through your history in idolatry and rebellion. As a matter of fact, you've been removed to Babylon because of rebellion and idolatry. And so now you're coming and asking me to give you directions. Why should I speak to you now? And that's what we saw in chapter 20. We saw that Ezekiel began to slowly rehearse the history of Israel and spoke of their history of idolatry. Now, instead of being God's people, I want you to see this is found uh, in this passage. Instead of being God's people, these were people who actually wanted to, to, to live as, as pagans. Notice verse 32. He says, What you have in your mind shall never be when you say, we will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries, serving wood and stone. They want to be just like the pagan nations surrounding them. Now, obviously, God had designed this nation for something else. From the very beginning, they were to be entirely separated. They were to be entirely different than the nations that surrounded them. When you look in the book of Exodus, for example, in chapter 19, and, and you read verses 5 and 6, God declares to them, this is what my plans are for you. He says, if you'll indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. The earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. My desire for you is for you to be a treasure. I want you to be special. I want you to be a, a nation that worships me. You will be a kingdom of priests and you will be a holy nation. Well, they didn't want to be like the... Uh, the God's design for them. They, they wanted to be like the nations that they were saved out of. They didn't want to be different. Now, God expects them to be different because they'd been called out. They'd been pulled out of, of Egyptian bondage. They, they had been delivered from idolatry. And so, obviously, God planned for them. His expectation for them is for them to be different. And if you speed that up into New Testament times, that's his expectation for us today. God actually expects the church to be a people who do not conform to the world. In 1 Peter, in chapter 2, verse 9, the apostle says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, we are supposed to be a people that are, are different. We are to be known as a people who are different. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's what Israel was supposed to be. People ought to see the way that we live and, and say there's something entirely different about you. What is it? We ought to live in such a way that people would look at us and say, it's obvious that you're, you're different than everybody in the office. You're different than the people in this neighborhood. It's obvious there's something about you that, that, that's made you different. I'm just wanting to know what it is. And that's what we're called to be, is to be different in that way. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed, but rather be transformed. And the earmark of, of a believer in Jesus Christ 
is that that person walks in the light. That person walks in the light because, because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And so when you and I are actually following the Lord, our life is going to be a life that's lived out as light. That's why Jesus would refer to us as the light of the world because the way that we live is entirely different because our life in its quality is actually supposed to be the, um, the way that people can see their own life and compare their life with your life and say, I'm missing something and whatever it is they have, that's what I want. And so that's Christianity. That's what it's supposed to be like. You see, this nation has, has come to the conclusion that they would get better results if they were like the pagans around them. Jeremiah, in chapter 44, verse 17, uh, says, We will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we've done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food, were well off, saw no trouble. We want to live as pagans because it's easier for us when we're living as pagans than it is when we're living as believers. And there are quite a number of people that I have known over the years who have said the same kind of thing as Christians. It was easier being, a, being you know, unsaved than it is being saved. It, you know, being a Christian, I'd be lying to you if I said it's an easy life. Get saved and you'll never have another problem. I would be lying to you through my teeth because it's, it's, it, it's a just it's a different kind of life. It's, it's a life that requires us to, to die to ourselves. It's a, a life that requires us to pick up a cross daily and to follow the Lord. It isn't an easy life, but it is a blessed life, and there's no better life at all than to follow Christ. But it's not an easy life at all. You see, there are, there are professing Christians who, who think it's a waste of time to be a Christian. They, they, they just think it's, it's, it's not fun anymore. I mean, my goodness, I used to have something to do on a Friday, on a Saturday. I could do something in, on a Sunday. I could sleep in. I could party. I could do whatever I wanted. You know, and, and now I got saved, and it's so boring, you know, there's nothing to do. You know, and that's kind of where it's at with us, you know. So instead of, 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 of God giving them direction, what God did is he brings a word of judgment to them, and, and, and he speaks. Notice verse 33, as I live, says the Lord God, surely with an, a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. So as he has reviewed their history, he gives them a glimpse into their future. And, and he says, listen, uh, remember how I manifested my power over the Egyptians, and, and, and I will do the same for you. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 34, we read, did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm? And by great terrors, according to all the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So he's reminding them, listen, remember how I delivered you out of Egypt? Well, I'm going to continue to use this mighty hand, this outstretched arm, and this fury. I'm going to continue to do that because I am going to rule over you. Now, I want you to notice something here in verse 33. Notice how he says at the conclusion of that verse, I will rule over you. That makes it very clear that his rule over them is yet in the future. At this time, Israel's in the nation of Babylon. And so this is something that God is saying, I'm going to be ruling over you, but it will be in your future. At this moment, they're assimilating. They have no desire for God. But God isn't going to let them go. He's not going to let them go. So he's making it clear, I am going to rule over you yet in the future. Verse 34, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. Now, he's not speaking about returning them from Babylon. It may be that those elders who are seated before Ezekiel are wondering, are we going to get out of here soon? And God is making it clear, no, this isn't something that's going to happen in the near future. I'm going to be regathering you out of the countries where you've been scattered. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you out of the countries where you have been scattered throughout the world. Now, this regathering, if you take notes, is a common theme you find in the Old Testament. You see it in Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 49, Jeremiah chapter 23, Amos chapter 9, as well as Zechariah chapter 10. You can see it throughout the Scriptures. God's promise 
that after they have failed him and after he has judged them and after he has scattered them throughout the world, he's going to regather them. All the way back in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy in chapter 30, God said, it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today. You and your children, with all your heart, with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. I'll gather you back. You go to Israel today, which is a modern miracle. You hear this often because it's absolutely true. Israel is a modern miracle. Anybody who does Bible studies, anybody who teaches knows this as a fact. If you start picking up commentaries that deal with the nation of Israel that were written by authors in the 1800s, early 1900s, 1700s, you can go back throughout the centuries. When you pick up their commentaries and you begin to study passages like this, those ancient writers will, will, will say that these kinds of uh, prophecies are actually fulfilled by the church because as those, as those commentators were writing, Israel didn't exist. Israel was scattered finally in A.D. 70 by the Romans, scattered throughout the world. And it's absolutely true. Jews are found throughout the world. You can find Jewish people in China, you find Jewish people in Japan. You find Jewish people throughout the world, all through the world. You know, there was this thing many of us grew up with, the stereotypes of what a Jewish person looked like. In, in Nazi Germany, they, they had a tremendous um, time drawing pictures of Jews. They were always with, the, you know, long hooked noses and, and just very, very homely people and all. And they did that on purpose to humiliate Jews. And a lot of people still have that kind of mentality. They say, well, if you ask them, what do you think a Jewish person looks like? Oh, and they can come up with this most interesting descriptions. I'll tell you something. We've been to Israel a number of times. And I'll tell you something. That stereotype is completely broken. There's absolutely no way you can look at somebody and know for a positive fact that this person is Jewish or not. Marie and I have gone to stores together. You know, I, well, she goes to stores and she drags me in. We go into stores. I've said this to you more than once, but it's, it's just accurately true. I, you walk into a store and she'll be standing next to me and, and the guy behind the counter will look at my wife and immediately speak Spanish to her, immediately, because he's from Spain. Just immediately will speak Spanish to her. You know, we've had that happen so many places. They'll, they'll, they, they, they don't know what you are. We've been in, we were inside of a, a shop in Megiddo, and, and um, we were there just talking to the person behind the counter, and Marie asks, where are you from? And the man looks at us, and he says, I'm from Mexico City. And Marie looks at him and says, from Mexico City? And he said, I'm a Jewish man from Mexico. You can go into Spain. I've said this to you before. Spain was heavily, heavily populated through the Jewish population, heavily populated. And there are those who will postulate that a good percentage of those with Spanish heritage actually are what are called Sephardic Jews. If your last name ends with an EZ or an ES and it's a Hispanic last name, there's a good possibility that you have Jewish heritage. Because during the Inquisition, what happened is there was a forced conversion that took place in the 1400s, the late 1400s. And the Spanish Jews took upon themselves last names that reflected the, uh, the uh, Spanish surnames. When I went to Madrid, Marie and I went to Madrid, Marie's maiden name is Lopez. Mine, obviously, my name's Rosales. And so we went to Madrid. And while we were there, we began to search our heritage and the first people that they have in the National Library there in Madrid that have 
the name Lopez and the name Rosales, th those people, their names were like Moses and Abraham. And so we, we believe that we have Jewish heritage because there are so many Hispanics that actually do have a Jewish heritage because there was a large population in, in Spain of Jews. And either you were converted, you were massacred, or you left. When you left Spain, you went to the new places like Mexico and South America. That's why I have had a Jewish guide who is an Orthodox Jew who speaks seven languages, but he's from South America, speaks fluent Spanish along with six other languages. That's why you see that. And so when the Bible speaks concerning the Jews being uh, sent throughout the world, that, that absolutely happened. And yet there's this regathering that God is speaking about. I will regather you from where I have scattered you. We have seen that in, in our lifetime. We have seen the regathering. Now, as we continue in Ezekiel, I'll give you some details about this because what you see is really the frame. You have the body without the life in it. But God has brought and is bringing back the Jewish uh, people from captivity. That's why this nation that didn't exist just, you know, just not that long ago now is, is, is the fifth most powerful nation in the face of the earth. It's because God is doing this work. And that's what he's saying in verse 34. 34, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered. He says in verses 35 and 36, he says to them, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will plead my case with you face to face, just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt. So I will plead my case with you, says the Lord God. Now, wilderness is to remind them of their wandering before God brought them to the promised land. The pagan nations are a picture of a wilderness because they have no spiritual life in them. God says, I'm going to bring you out of this wilderness and I will personally face-to-face -face deal with you. See, you don't go to the world to get spiritual life. You don't go to the world to get spiritual direction. You don't go to the world to get communication about the things of God. The world can't offer you that because the world doesn't have that. And so God says, I'm going to draw you out. I'm going to bring you into the wilderness of people, but I'll plead my case before you. Now, in verse 37, he says, I will make you pass under the rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now notice how he says, I will make you pass under the rod. That phrase, pass under the rod, is an interesting phrase. That's how the shepherd would number the sheep in order that he might give a portion of those sheep as a tithe unto the Lord. So passing under the rod is another way of speaking of counting the sheep. In Leviticus 27, 32, concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. So what God is saying here very simply is this. Listen, I'm going to be bringing you into Israel, but I will have you pass under this rod in order that I might separate my sheep from those who are not my sheep. I'm going to separate the true from the false. Because there's a whole lot of people who consider themselves to be true when in reality they don't have a relationship with God. How do you know whether you've got a relationship with God? There are so many Americans and people throughout the world who claim to be Christians. How do you know that you have a relationship with God? How do you know that? The Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a son of God. When I receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, my body, I become the temple of the Spirit of God. God doesn't dwell in a temple made with human hands. This building is simply a building. We know that it's just a structure. It's just some walls that have been tilted up, carpeting and some pews and, and things like that. It's just, it's just a building. We know that. The true building... The true house of God is not made with human hands. 
No human being could ever create something that was good enough for God to dwell in. Therefore, God created something that's good enough for himself. He created man. He created human beings, humanity. And he said, you will be my temple and I will dwell within you. When I got saved, I became the temple of the Spirit of God. When I got saved, I actually became his dwelling place. I am now his temple. That did not come because I was water baptized as an infant when I was four months old. That did not come because I went through my first communion class and received Holy Communion. That did not come because I was confirmed at the age of 13 and as a Roman Catholic. It didn't come through those things. The way that I became the temple of the Spirit of God was when God's Holy Spirit convicted me and made me aware of sin, righteousness, and judgment, made me aware of the fact that I don't have a relationship with God. It came through conviction where God, by His Spirit and through His Word, said, do you love me? Do you love my word? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is real, not just a conceptual one where you can speak concerning him in a season like Easter or Christmas? Do you really have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Do you have that knowledge of God where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I know that I know that I know I have a relationship with him. And how do you know that? Do you know that because you've been born again? Or do you know that because somebody told you you're a Christian because you were water baptized? What do you use as the significant cause of your conversion? Did you one day repent of your sin? Did you one day ask God to forgive you? Did you one day say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, enter into my life? Were you born again? There are quite a number of people who say, I'm a Christian, but I'm not born again. You cannot be a Christian without being born again. It's impossible. And so God says, listen, there are people that are going to try to enter into this promised land. I will put them under the rod. That's a judgment because I'm going to separate the true from the false. And those who are not mine are not going to enter in. See, some will come to the land, but they're going to be rejected. They're going to be purged. They're not going to be allowed to settle in the land of promise. Now, obviously, this is in the last days, and it pertains to the nation of Israel. It's going to be taking place during a time, and I can't really get into this tonight, but that is referred to in the, in the Scripture. Jesus spoke of it as the tribulation and the great tribulation, a seven-year period of history at the end of time prior to the return of Christ where God has regathered the nation of Israel and God begins to do a work in which he brings people from Israel to a saving knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 7 through 10, it says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck, and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God, David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Therefore do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar, your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. And so God is saying, I will bring you back and I will allow those who have a relationship with me to enter in to my promises. Now, in verse 39, as, as for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve every one of you as idols, and hereafter, if you will not obey me, but profane my holy name no more with your gifts and your idols. Now, he's saying, do what you want. Your hearts are turned towards idols. So go enjoy yourself with your idols. I'm not going to force you to love me. You love me out of your own choices. I've shared this with you before. Some of you will remember. It's a true story. When I was a kid, young, starting to have relationships with girls, I think I was about four or five. Now, when I was... <laughs> I always like girls. Uh, that's, that's actually true. But, um, but in my teens, trying to have relationships, I, I wanted to make the girls love me. 
wanted to make them love me and the way that I thought I could make them love me is agree with everything they had to say take them places they wanted to go you know do things like that be jealous if they went out with somebody else show them my emotions I used to write I used to write letters and I would pour my heart out furiously to the girl I was in love with. I mean, I would say, oh, I love you, and, 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 and I'd write them poetry, and, and I would find um, songs that were being played on the radio that said everything that I wanted to say. Yeah, I did. And I'd send it to them, and for some reason they thought I was crazy. I, I, I know. <laughs> But that's, how, that's what I do. I, was, I tried so hard to make them love me, to make them love me. Did everything in my power to do so and just never was successful. Well, sometimes they'd like me for a while. Sometimes they'd even use the word love. But none of those relationships ever lasted. So one day I made a decision. I decided I'm going to stop being a phony and I'm going to just be who I am. Because maybe these girls are rejecting a person who's not even real. So I met this girl named Marie. And I said, Marie, I'd like to take you out. I didn't say, where do you want to go? I didn't say, what do you want to eat? I just would say, I'm going to go out. Would you like to go with me? And Marie did. I mean, wherever I wanted to go, she, she hung around. So I would take her to the places I liked to eat. You know, there was a time when I'd be with the gal and I'd say to the girl, you know, what kind of music do you like? Anything she liked. Oh, man, that is the best. Oh, man, you're, you are so, that is so yeah, hot. Oh, good, yes, uh-huh. <laughs> I love country and western music. Well, hot dog, so do I. You know, I mean, I mean... Whatever it is. I hate country and western music. I hate it. But not when I was with them. I had my cowboy hat on and everything. <laughs> Belt buckles. Then I started going out with Marie. And I was me. Just me. This is who I am. This is who I am. Don't want to be somebody else. Don't want to be something different. Just me. And I've told you this. We were driving one day. We'd been going out for a short time, maybe four months, three or four months. We're driving on the 5 freeway. We're in Anaheim. We drive by this club. And Marie says, oh, I was there last night. I said, really? She goes, yeah, I was there dancing. Marie liked to go dancing. I said, really? She goes, yeah. I said, oh. She said, some guy was hit, hitting, up, hitting me up. I said, really? She goes, yeah. He asked for my phone number. I said, really? Did you give it to him? She goes, no, I didn't. I said, why not? She says, I told him my boyfriend wouldn't like it. And as I was driving, she says, I told him my boyfriend wouldn't like it. I looked at her, and I said, you got a boyfriend? I, true story. You got, you got a boyfriend? She goes, yeah. Who? I was flabbergasted. Absolutely. You got a boyfriend? I've been taking you out for five, four months, five months. You've got a boyfriend? Yeah. Who? She goes, you. I looked at her. I said, are you kidding me? If I were your boyfriend, you wouldn't be out dancing. I never told her not to go dancing. Never did. It's a decision she has to make. But I made it real clear. You know what? You want me, some things are going to go. She made that choice. It, is, it wasn't the 11th commandment, thou shalt not dance and call <laughs> yourself. Dave's girl. I mean, see, listen, you want to go out and you want to blow it, 
You want to be an idolater and you want to sin and you want to go to hell, God says, then do it. Do it. I'll let you do it. Talk about total freedom to make decisions. You have that. You, you, you want to go to hell? Is that where you want to go? Is that where you want to go? I had some guy tell me one time, I'm going to go to hell because that's where all my friends are. We're going to be partying. I said, man, are you crazy? Are you kidding me? You ought to read your Bible and find out what it says about hell. You're not going to be partying, I promise you. No, you won't even recognize your friends. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. But you know what? The Lord is saying here, listen, make your choice. If you want to make a choice for idolatry, if you want to be in that, then make your choice. Go and serve every one of you as idols and hereafter. If you will not obey me, but profane my holy name no more with your gifts and your idols. Make a choice. Who are you going to serve? What do you want? I remember this guy telling me one time, do you drink? And I said, what do you mean? Do you drink alcohol? Do you drink beers? Do you drink wine? Do you drink? I said, no. He said, no, I don't. He goes, that's why I don't want to be a Christian. You can't drink. I said, what do you mean I can't drink? I said, I can drink. I choose not to drink. It, it's not a matter of, oh, now that I'm saved, I can't smoke, I can't chew, and I can't date girls who do. It's not one of those dumb things. <laughs> and where'd you get that from, anyway? I can't drink. I said, I could drink as much as I want, when I want, I don't want to. See, the thing is, God changed my desires. I don't want to. I don't desire to. I have no need to. It's all gone from me. I don't want to. Why would I want to do something like that? I, I've got something right now that is so much better than anything I ever had. Why would I want to? But see, that's what the Lord is saying. Listen, do you want to have a relationship with God or do you want to have an abomination like an idol? Make up your mind and I'll let you do that. But I am not going to have a relationship with you. So you need to understand that you're making a choice that is going to cause you to be rejected by me. It's like Joshua 24, 15, where, where we read it, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, well, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In Matthew 12, 30, we read, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Either you're with Jesus, he said, or you're in opposition to him. But there's no neutrality. There's no in-between. Either you're with him or you're not. It's like the girl says, I'm a little pregnant. No, there's no such thing as a little pregnant. Either you are or you're not. But what do you mean a little? You aren't going to be little for a long, you know, for long. I mean, if you're pregnant, you're pregnant. Well, either you're in or you're out, but you're not in-between. In verse 40, for, my, for on my holy mountain, on the mountain height of Israel, says the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I will accept them, and there I will require your offerings and the first, first fruits of your, your sacrifices, together with all your holy things. I will accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you've been scattered. And I will be hollowed in, in you before the Gentiles, and then you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I raised my hand in an oath to give to your fathers. Israel will be refined. Israel will be purged. And those who rebel against God, he says, will be dealt with. During this period called the tribulation that's coming in the future, God will deal with those who are in rebellion against him. Zechariah 13, 7 through 9 says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. It shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name. I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. 
So at the end of the tribulation, as God has refined and purged out those as he's having them go under that rod there and be counted, Israel's spiritual restoration ultimately will be realized. And there will be those in the land who follow the Lord. And these are the ones, according to verse 40, who will render priestly service to God. And God says, I will accept your service. In verse 41, he says, I will accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you've been scattered. I will be hollowed in you before the Gentiles. And then you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I raised my hand in an oath to give to your fathers. You will be regathered, no longer being a stench in God's nostrils. Your idolatry led to your rejection. Your repentance brings you into fellowship. And now you will be witnesses of God's mercy and you will be witnesses of God's grace. As it says in Zechariah 8:23, in those days ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of the Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And this all takes place in the literal nation of Israel. This is the country that God swore to them and made a promise that they would have. In verse 43, And there you shall remember your ways and all your doings with which you were defiled. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight because of all the evils that you have committed. And then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways nor according to your corrupt doings, O house of Israel. It's interesting how he puts this here. He said you're going to remember your ways and your doings. In other words, you're going to look back and realize what kind of life you lived. And that's going to cause you to be genuinely repentant and it's going to cause you to hate your sin. Do you know it takes some maturity in the Lord to actually start hating your sin, to actually hate it. You know, when I look back at my old life before Christ, and yes, I was a young man when I got saved, and I thank God for that. But I can tell you that there are still times when I will remember, as a matter of fact, I remember every day one thing or other. But I can tell you this. I hate what I used to do. I hate how I hurt my mom. I hate how I hurt my father. When I think about the pain I caused them, it's something that, that stays with you. When my dad went home to be with the Lord and the doctors allowed us to go into the hospital room where my father had, had died, and we all walked in, my family, Mama, my family and I all walked in and, and I can tell you this, I stood there and my dad, the body of my father in front of me and the very first thing I can remember saying, and my dad was already in heaven, it was just a shell, it was just a body, but when I looked at the shell of the man I called Daddy, I looked at him and I said, I brought such shame to your name. First thing, I brought such shame to your name. First thing, I said, Daddy, I'm so sorry. So sorry. Thirty years after getting saved, I was pastoring this church. God had used me mightily. But in the back of my mind, the first thing I thought of was, Daddy, I hurt you. Hating your sin. Hating it. Not glorying in it, but hating it. And then I went on to say, but I hope that I made you proud after I got saved. I hope I made you proud. See, the Lord is going to make it clear when you have a relationship with him 
you don't want to go back to those old days. You don't want to go back to those old ways. You hate those things. You don't want to be part of that anymore. You're going to hate your sins. You will be genuinely repentant. He says in verse 43, there you shall remember your ways and all your doings with which you were defiled, and you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight because of all the evils that you've committed. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Then you will be so grateful because of the mercy and goodness and love that I showed you when I saved you. As evil as you were, I saved you and you will be forever grateful for my mercy and my love. And finally, furthermore, verse 45, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward the south, preach against the south, prophesy against the forest land, the south. So this is speaking about Israel, southern Israel, and say to the forest of the south, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you and it shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame shall not be quenched and all faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. All flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. And then I said, Oh, Lord God, they say of me, does he not speak parables? Now, this passage, according to many scholars, actually goes best with chapter 21 because this is not related to a far distant event. This is something that is about to occur. Obviously, the south isn't speaking of Babylon. It's speaking of Israel. The forest land reminds us of how beautiful and heavily forested Israel at one time was. The fire is a picture of severe judgment. And the thought is that Babylon will so soon invade and, and will bring desolation. That, that occurs in the history of Israel in 586 B.C. And though Babylon will destroy... It is really the Lord that is judging the idolatry of Israel. And that's what God is saying. The response is, they didn't get it. Lord God, they say of me, does he not speak parables? They just didn't get it. And sometimes, even to this day, people still just don't get it.